Hi, I'm Tom Cherry Holmes, and I'm just a hacker having fun. This video is actually a part of my series on my adventures in Forth, particularly where they relate to creating my graphics demo. In this video, we pick up where we left off, showing some of the basics of Forth and some of the introductory pieces by expanding on this and creating a and continuing on our introduction. Before we actually uh, continue, I would recommend actually picking up a copy of the uh, FigForth installation manual. This is a very valuable piece of documentation which can show you uh, what words you can use, how you can use them, and other bits and pieces such as how to use the FigForth editor, all of which are presented on the uh, FigForth disk that I have. So we can go over and grab it. It's very easy to find. You can find it here at the following address. Go off and grab it. And all you need to do is grab this file right here, figints.zip. Uncompress it. And you get inside here a text file containing the FigForth installation guide. Very easy to get. And You'll see here that this was actually scanned from an original document. It's very old. It's been cleaned up. As you can see, dated November 1980. <laughs> but it is exactly the language that we need. And inside of it, you see some notes on how to take and port the fig forth to a new computer. Uh, some notes on creating RAM disk simulations, that sort of thing as well as the standard Ford, uh, memory map here showing you how everything kind of fits into the memory map and finally and let's scroll this down just a little bit the fig fourth glossary very invaluable because what this actually contains is a list of all the different words that you can use inside forth what parameters they need in order to work and what they will pass out of the stack when they're done very very useful but especially with regards to the particular video that I'm doing right now it also contains an exhaustive documentation on the editor down near the bottom of the file. This is very, very important, especially when you start to modify and create your own code on disks on using the screens. So with that, we have this open. We'll take and uh, push it a little bit to the side here. Also, as before, we have uh, our little handy utility here for mapping the Atari. And we also have uh, Karsten Strokeman's wonderful wiki uh, up, the Atari wiki, which contains a great deal of information on uh, different uh, implementations of Forth, as well as other languages available for the Atari 8-bit, and all in all, a very valuable resource. In our case here, we're using, I use it to look as a quick reference to the various screens that are actually on the disk. But what is a screen? Well, let's find out. First, we'll go ahead and we will put my base fifth fig fourth disk in and we'll reboot as before back into our fig fourth environment now I'm going to introduce a new command here and this one is analogous to the list command in basic again in fourth it's called list but it works a little differently list requires one parameter the screen that you want to list now we are going to use as a reference here 
and this is why I pulled up uh, uh, Karsten's wiki here. We see that the first screen starts on screen 17. So to list screen 17, that gets us what's on screen 17 on the disk. But what is a screen? Well, a screen, very simply, is an area of the disk that is divided into 16 lines, line numbered 0 through 15, and 64 characters on each line. This maps exactly to 1024 bytes, which is coincidentally the same as 8 128-byte disk sectors on the Atari. And yes, actually, these uh, disk sectors actually start at sector 1, and they go all the way up to sector 720. We can further bear this out by literally trying to list the very first screen on the disk. And as you can see right there, you see a lot of gobbledygook. But what you're literally seeing there are the raw sectors of that disk arranged out as a screen. And the reason that that first screen is all zeros is because, well, the first, uh, first 60 sectors or so on this disk contain the fourth interpreter because it was saved out in this manner. And what you're seeing are those disk sectors. So you typically want to steer clear of that when you're doing, if you decide to put your fourth interpreter on the same disk as your source code. But let's go ahead and further this along a bit further. Let's go back and look at some of the screens on the disk here. Again, we have our full load here. What this is right here, if you can look at the individual pieces, if you can probably guess here, uh, this has a command 21 load here, which loads uh, the debugger screen, 27 load, which loads the editor, 39, which loads the assembler. Well, if you look at what's on screen 21, you see fourth code for some words pertaining to the debugger. H dot B question mark free to get the number of free bytes, etc. And that's the thing. On a screen, you can format the code any way that you want. It really doesn't matter. And anything that is inside one of these screens, it is as if it has been typed directly from the console, directly into the interpreter. There is no distinction. And you can see that here actually on line four. Uh, where we literally have an immediate instruction. We're not defining a word, but we're just saying loading debugger aids. It just pr prints a message as this screen gets loaded. Also a special note here is line 14, which is uh, a little uh, word that looks like an arrow, dash, dash, greater than. And that literally means continue on loading the next screen. And here you have more and more words being defined for things that you need. Again, screen 22, we move on. Screen 23. Screen 24. Screen 25. Screen 26. Now notice here on the bottom of screen 26, we have a word that's out here by itself, semicolon s. That tells the fourth interpreter, or the loader more specifically, to stop reading screens, to stop loading here, and return back to, uh, and return back to where we were. Now this is of special note because if we look back on screen 18 again, that means it will continue on from this point once this is finished and execute the next command over here, which is 27 load. A special note here too, you'll notice the parentheses are comments. Anything you put into a comment 
is basically ignored by the fourth interpreter or compiler. So there you go. So what this has here, what this screen is right here, we're using this screen to provide a convenient way to load three different chunks of screens for different functionality. We could choose to load these individual screens individually if we only wanted the debugger, or if we only wanted the editor, or if we only wanted the assembler, or if we want everything, we just load this screen here, which we'll do right now. Now I'll go ahead and fast forward here, but as you can see here, it took and executed that uh, immediate instruction to print the message of loading the debugger aids. And you can do stuff like that all the time. You can execute immediate instructions when you hit a load. There's no distinction, again, from you typing something into a screen and typing it into the fourth interpreter. Now, of note here, uh, these are warning messages. They're okay. I'll explain what they are in a later video. Not right now. Just know that it's okay and that they're harmless for what we need. Hmm. So, the assembler loads, and I'll go ahead and warp speed across, and we're done. So now, we have a whole set of words that have been added here. Namely, code, assembler, where, editor, mark, line, text, and a few others basically to build what we need to. So now we have everything that we need. 